If you look around at our world, you'll see lots of crosses all around us. Of course, on church steeples, around people's necks, on hot cross buns and WWJD, what would Jesus do bracelets? And this is not new. The cross and other various cruciforms or cross-like images have long been used by various cultures and religions as symbols of life. For some, the cross might depict the four corners of the earth, the four elements of creation, the four beasts in a scheme of the zodiac, the four solstices and equinoxes, the four winds. Ancient Egypt used the cross as a symbol of eternal life. And a lot of New Age religion has popularized the image of a cross tree, with each corner representing one season of the tree's annual cycle. In all these examples, the cross is a symbol of the life of nature, or the life of a community. But try telling that to Roman-occupied Israel. To them, the cross was anything but life-giving. Too many of them had seen friends and loved ones murdered on them. Too many of them had encountered forests of trees, terrible reminders to anyone who broke Roman law. From stealing to murder, the punishment was the same. They had to keep these rebellious folks in line somehow. And that's why the crowds cheered when Jesus arrived at the holy city. Finally, someone was coming who would stop the cruelty, who would throw the Romans out and bring Israel back to his former glory, a glory not seen since King David ruled so many years ago. And they pinned all their hopes on this poor backwoods preacher. He could heal sick people. So maybe he could heal the political sickness that kept God's people from inheriting their destiny. He could cast out demons. So maybe he could cast out the demonic tyranny of these Roman oppressors. He could raise the dead. So maybe he could raise the people to reclaim their citizenship as God's chosen people, a light to the nations. But when they saw Jesus in handcuffs, they started asking questions. He wouldn't speak up for himself, they grumbled against each other. Would he speak up for us? If he wouldn't defend himself, then he wouldn't defend us. If he wouldn't rescue himself, he couldn't rescue us, he couldn't save them. So when they realized he wasn't going to be the liberator they hoped, they turned on him and they gleefully watched him die. The cross was saved for the lowest class of people. The Romans knew that it was the most painful and terrifying form of torture and death. The victim could hang there for days. And when the Romans got bored, they crucified their victims upside down while their families watched in agony. So for many, most of these people the cross was anything but life-giving. And the early Christians didn't like the imagery of the cross. They didn't use it in their worship and their art really until centuries after its actual use had declined. Because for them, the cross was still so, so raw. It was still an instrument of death. If it was empty, it didn't mean resurrection. If it was waiting, it was empty. It was waiting in deathly silence for its next victim, like an empty hangman's noose or an unoccupied electric chair. The empty cross was not a symbol of hope. It was an object of dread. If Jesus was pictured on the cross, his tortured body was a reminder of his agony, not his resurrection and not our salvation. But they then, they used the cross to retell Jesus' story because they knew in their own flesh and bones that Jesus' story had become their story and their story had become his. They couldn't make it beautiful. 
They couldn't explain the torture of the cross away, and so they didn't picture it. But they also knew something had happened in those holy days that forever transformed their lives, and not just them, us too. So when we look to the cross, we know that when we are rejected, he has borne that rejection. We know that when we have failed, he has borne that failure. We know that when we have sinned, he has borne that sin. And we know that when we die, he has borne our death. We know this because his story and our story have been woven together in a strange tapestry. Stories that collide with this story that we gather to hear today to remember how God entered our story in Jesus and how we find our way into God's story through Christ. Because in Jesus, God has entered your story when it looks like your story might have not unfolded the way that you wanted it to. When conditions and circumstances take the narrative of your life in a direction you didn't expect and certainly didn't want. When dreams crumble under the weight of family obligations or social expectations, or when you look at, at your life and you know that you're capable of so much more. And when you read the news and you wonder if human greed will lead to the collapse of a system that's sustaining it. When the doctor enters the examining room and the look on her face tells you that the news is not good. When you look across the table and you wonder who this stranger is that you've been married to all these years. When you find yourself at the desk of a funeral director saying goodbye to someone who has gone too soon and everyone has gone too soon. When you feel your own life draining from you and you're terrified that when you close your eyes in death, you may never open them again, despite the promises of everlasting life that you've heard since you were a child. Today, this Good Friday, those stories become God's stories. They're woven together so that our stories of sadness, of struggle, of regret and death, and that God's great big story of creation and life, forgiveness and salvation are tied together so that the ending to our story will change and the strand that ties those two stories together is Jesus. Because that day on that cross, it was Jesus who wasn't just standing up to the destructive powers of this world. Jesus wasn't just confronting all the forces that defy God's creative and life-giving vision for the world. But that day on the cross, Jesus was standing up to God on our behalf. Jesus was showing God what it's like to be human. Jesus was showing God what it means to be in pain. Jesus was showing God what it's like to lose a child. Jesus was showing God what it feels like to die. Because that day on the cross, through Jesus, God endured the worst of human experience. That day on that cross, God endured the frustrations of limitations, the terror of mortality, the outrage of injustice, the agony of brokenness, the violence of sin, the anguish of estrangement, the ruin of disease, the alienation of isolation, the sadness of separation, and the threat of oblivion. In Jesus, God learned what it means to be human, and God was exposed to the world that human beings live with. Because it was from Jesus' view on the cross that God saw how easy it can be for human beings and countries to invade each other just to enlarge their territory where massive disparity between the rich and the poor can be justified or even celebrated, where disease can destroy, almost destroy entire continents while the rest of the world just shrugs its shoulders, where the world's great religions can fight for dominance rather than serving those in need. It was from Jesus' view on the cross that God saw how easy it can be that planes can fall from the sky leaving their loved ones with open wounds of grief where seemingly healthy children can go to bed at night and not wake up the next morning, 
where people can discriminate against others simply because they are different, where human pride can destroy lifelong friendships, how the human impulse to self-protection can overpower the human longing for love. In Jesus, in that moment on Calvary, when Jesus looked out at a mocking crowd and felt the searing pain run through his entire body, God found out what it's like to be absolutely helpless and hopeless. In Jesus, God learned what your life is like, what your life can be like. In Jesus, God learned what the world is like, and not from some far off heaven where God looks down at us from a safe distance, quietly observing us. But in Jesus, God learned what the world is like from the very heart of human existence, where Jesus took all the suffering, all the grief, all the fear, all the hopelessness, all the injustice, all the sin, all those things that keep us from God and all those things that hurt ourselves and each other and were nailed to the cross with Jesus and buried with him in the tomb. And today, as we place Jesus in his grave, we look at our lives, we look at ourselves, we look at each other and we look at our world with eyes open for the God who destroyed our delusions about who we are and is demanding that we are honest about our vulnerability, recognizing our culpability, and embracing our weakness. Because today, in this Good Friday, we remember that we are buried with him as the stone is rolled in front of his grave and seals him in. And then we wait. Amen.